kind of flaring up again, and I'm going to the doctor Wednesday, so if you would pray for me in this ablation, this heart issue, I would appreciate it very much. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a praise, too, for my dad. Um, you guys were praying for him. He's had um, cancer for years and got over it and come back. And um, he told me that when at the peak, his PSA, and those, those of you know what the PSA numbers are, his was at a 59. Um, and with, through the treatments and everything else, he's down to 1.3 now. So praise Amen. God. He's so weak. He's hopefully cancer-free. So. Praise and thank you for all your prayers. Okay, yeah, we're going to continue in the spirit of worship, and we just want to remind you that the altar is always open. Some big needs, and um, we know who to take them to. I have a praise report that my family's here. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A bit emotional because it's been a while since we've all gotten to do this, so. Thank you to Marty and the team for letting my family be here with my family. Now we're all family. <laughs> so we're going to um, do a song that's been around for a while, and a lot of you probably know it. And um, if you don't, you'll pick up on it quick. But there's a powerful message, and I just encourage you to let the word soak in. And again, pray at your seats, raise your hands, however you feel free to worship. You are free. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's sing. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all.
Father, we just thank you this morning for your sweet presence. Father, we thank you that there's power in the name of Jesus. We thank you that there's no other name. So thankful that we can come to you freely with all our sin and all our hang-ups and you welcome us and there's power in your name if we call out to you there is something about the name of Jesus so we just thank you for your presence this morning we thank you for your faithfulness we thank you that you love your people we thank you that you want more we thank you that we can do more through you We thank you for who you and how you see us and help us to not be slaves to fear, that we can step into that sea that you split before us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Certainly before and after the teaching time, we want to be able to make the altar available. So what a great God we serve. Amen? Amen. It's great. It's fantastic. Well, as we continue with our worship series, we're, I believe, in our third week. And 
this week we are going into uh, this is going to be a, a very weighty topic and you could choose any title for it I just chose God is holy and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6 if you did not bring your Bibles it's okay there's one right in front of you but Isaiah is in the Old Testament, and you're going to have to go past Psalms, pretty much everybody knows where Psalms are, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, then Isaiah, and Isaiah chapter 6. As you're turning there, um, one main point I want to bring up before we get started, and it'll come on the screen in just a second. And it's this, if you have not experienced the holiness of God in your life, you've missed it. If you have not experienced the holiness of God in your life, you've missed it. And if you have experienced the holiness of God, but don't include it in your daily life, you're missing it. It is, it is like gasoline to a car. It is like... Uh, air that we breathe, Christianity and holiness go together. They just do. And it's a very, in other, word, in other words, we need it to live out the Christian life. We absolutely need it. And so today we're going to be getting into uh, a lot about the holiness of God and how important it is within our worship, within our worship. But if, again, if we have not experienced the holiness of God in our lives, we've missed it. We've totally missed it. Let me bring a little bit of context. In the late 20th century and early 21st century, it's very popular in America and Western culture to say, okay, I'm going to sign a card or I'm going to walk the aisle and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And then go back and live anything kind of way that you want. It's very easy to do that. And churches, to their discredit, have made it very easy for that to happen. And so when it comes to Monday through Saturday, the world is hearing you say, I'm a Christian, but they're not seeing that type of behavior that's going to back up those words. And the main ingredient that's missing from that is a love for holiness and nobody is perfect I get that nobody is perfect but at the same time if we do not have holiness in our lives we're missing it we're absent somewhere there was a disconnect somewhere it didn't something did not make sense something did not jive well and so we've got to figure that out and so to do that, we're going to go to the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, you're going to see a beautiful picture. Everybody say beautiful. Beautiful. Right, excellent. You're going to see a beautiful picture of healing. You're going to see a beautiful picture of God and all of his glory. You're going to see a beautiful picture of what God does with a person who's broken. You're going to see all these different things. And within the book of Isaiah... You see a man who is broken. You see a man who is called by God to teach and preach, and almost nobody would listen to him. Can you imagine if you had a message? Let's say this. You go to your family, and you tell them over and over and over again that you love them, but they don't want to listen to you. That's what Isaiah was going through. And by the way, his name, Isaiah, it means the Lord is salvation. The Lord is my rescuer. Now, the book was written somewhere between 739 to 681 B.C., a little bit over 500 years before Christ. And at that time, Judah was ruled by a guy named King Uzziah. King Uzziah. It's a different name, but Judah was ruled by a guy named King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was a great ruler up until the end of his reign when he started assuming the, the roles and the privileges of a priest. 
and he shouldn't have done that. He should have kept to his own job, but he got his nose mixed up in other people's business, and as a result, God, being who he is, he is a just and holy God, he judged him for it, and King Uzziah got leprosy, and he ended up dying. And, but whether or not King Uzziah would have uh, gotten into sin or not, fact was, is that Judah was in a, in a culture and a climate of, of declining. People were moving away from the word of God. People were going away from God. People were turning their, their eyes away from God. And that's one thing that we need to do here in America is that we need to realize that there are times in our lives where we get so used to the presence of God that we begin to stay away from him. It's weird how that happens because you can get so used to God's blessings that you forget about him. In a very big sense, Judah got used to the blessings of God. Uzziah got used to the blessings of God, started doing his own thing, thought he had it under control, and as a result, he ended up getting leprosy. So along comes Uzziah. Uzziah knew the king, or Uzziah knew who Isaiah was. There was a connection there. And when we get into Isaiah chapter 6, we see a man named Isaiah who is broken because his friend has just died. And we're also going to see here a picture of the king is leaving because he's dying. The king is leaving his kingdom. He's dying. He's going to end up going to heaven. And Judah's not going to be left with the king. And, I, and as I, I was studying for this, I thought of all things, what, what does it feel like? to have a, a kingdom without a king? What does it feel like to have a country without a president? What does it feel like in a family to have the kids and maybe one of the spouses is gone? And I thought about the pain that a single mom may go through. And I thought about the pain that maybe a single dad goes through. And I thought of these different things. When one of those components is missing, what do you do? certainly you're broken. There is a period of time where there is a, a bit of brokenness. And so the reason why I'm going out of my way to really explain the picture to you is so that you can see you had not only a country that was broken, you also had a person. Isaiah is broken. And I need you to know that in the midst of your brokenness, if you're going through a season of brokenness, Jesus, yes, he cares about the whole country. Yes, he cares about the whole family, but he also cares about you individually. He sees everything that's going on. He has not missed one uh, breath that comes out of your mouth. He has not missed one whisper that comes into your ear. He has not missed any of that. He is still on the throne. But you still go through the practical pain. And Judah was going through the practical pain. Where's the king? We need somebody. And you would think, especially in our culture today, you would think that God would see that brokenness and he would answer with love, 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 mercy, 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 mercy. Because that is how we process here in the American culture. We think that God is just love. Now, God is love. There's no question about it. Does God provide mercy? Absolutely. But in this particular story, it's interesting how God, at, at the very front of everything that, that Isaiah is getting ready to, to see, it's very interesting that he answers with holiness. And he lets Isaiah see his holiness. And even those who are broken... They need, though they need grace, God seems fit sometimes to show himself that he is holy. And as you'll see, as the story unfolds, you'll see that the love and the mercy and the healing is going to come. 
God is getting ready to show Isaiah something he has never seen before, and it is going to freak him out. <laughs> okay? He is going to have Isaiah see something that is going to totally blow his mind, literally blow his mind. He is going to show Isaiah a vision that literally should have killed him, and it didn't. Have you ever seen something that's just totally blown your mind? Mm -hmm. I remember in, uh, when I was in the Navy, and I think I've told this story before, but I had to bring it up again. When I was in the Navy, I, I was stationed uh, for a time over in Iceland. And so at that time of year, there was about 23, 24 hours of darkness. And can you imagine having to sleep in something or go through your day and then sleep and all the rest? And then there's another season where there's 23 to 24 hours of nothing but daylight. We literally had aluminum foil on the windows so we can get some kind of semblance of nighttime and daytime. It's the weirdest thing. But during the time of, of darkness, um, I can remember one time I was getting ready to get out of my barracks and then take the, the bus over to... Uh, over to the airplane hangar where I worked. As I came out, and I had never seen anything like this before, but it's dark and there's white, it's snow on the ground. And of course, because it's Iceland, it's like 20, 15 degrees, something like that. I get out there in the, in the cold and all of a sudden, I just felt like I needed to look up in the sky. And I look up in the sky and there's all of a sudden, these lights started showing up, and these wavings of light. I think we have a picture to show people, and these, the, and it was the aurora borealis, the northern lights. And these, they did that. They did the waving a little bit, but these, in particular, I think God chose these just to freak me out. He showed me some things that went like this. Imagine seeing a whole bunch of lights at the top just coming right down exploding right in front of you and coming back up and doing that over and over. When I saw that, ladies and gentlemen, I hit my face to the floor, to the ground, in the snow. I mean, my body, I just gave out. My, my knees literally became weak and I hit the floor. It freaked me out. I had never seen anything quite like that. It was amazing. And I picked myself off the floor. Something else that I saw that was Totally amazing was this weekend at the fair. I got to see my, uh, my first real tractor pull. That was awesome. <laughs> it was me. I was at Alyssa's uh, graduation party, and unbeknownst to us, they actually had a, a tractor pull. Did you actually hire people to, to come in and do the tractor pull, Alyssa? No, you didn't. Wasn't that weird? There was a tractor pull going on right next to your graduation party. Anyway, you provided entertainment. Kudos to you. Um, and to your dad, how much did you pay those guys, Ken? My goodness. Anyway, but, and those were small tractors, but when we saw this the other night, I mean, it was a whoa, 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 And we saw this tractor, and it was literally, it was going up like this, and I don't know if any of you saw this, but one of the tractors, it totally lost it. It got to the end of the line, and it was like somebody stuck a hose down in the engine, and there was just liquid and fluid coming out all over the engine and just stopped in this big billow of smoke coming at us. It was awesome. It was so cool. <laughs> it was so neat. I mean, I need to get a part-time job uh, trying to promote these things like Sunday, 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 tractor pull, and counter, duh, duh. I mean, it was awesome. And I mean, sign me up for the next one because I'm going. I got to see this. I've seen these things I've never seen before. It's amazing. Ohio is awesome, is it not? Yes. Very cool stuff. It was neat. But anyway, man, that was cool. We could just talk all day. Man. Talk all day about the tractor pull. No, we're not gonna do that. But it was cool. But let's let's bring it back down to earth. Here we go with with things that have never been seen before, uh, God doing amazing things, and this, this whole thing, God is getting ready to show a broken man 
what reality really is. Doesn't mean your pain is not real. Everything we go through in this life is real. It hurts. In some cases, it's destructive. And we feel it. We feel the pain, literally. And I think sometimes there is room for us to say, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath and count on the power of God, and I need to move on from this. There, there are those times. But in this case, this nation was going through a very painful time, and you can relate because you, being human, have gone through your lives with a lot of pain. Jesus said it like this, in this life you will see trouble. Mm -hmm. And you feel it. God doesn't leave us alone. And sometimes God does not answer the way that we think he should answer us. Sometimes he does answer in a whisper. But in this case, he's going he's gonna to surprise us with like a deer in the headlights. Another quick thing about Ohio is almost every night we go outside and take our big old flash or little flashlight that has a lot of lumens and we can see on the ridge deer out there with their, and they see the eye shine. I can't even imagine what Isaiah was feeling like. Let's just go ahead and get into it. And remember, this is about worship. Worship is not authentic without holiness. It cannot be. You'll fool yourself for a little while, but in the end, you will see that worship is not authentic without the component of holiness. Isaiah 6, 9, or 6, verses 1 through 9. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And above, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. And with two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, and this is Isaiah saying this, Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Now I've got it going dot, 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 because he starts to say a lot of different things. He gives Isaiah instructions, which is very important. It's scripture, of course. But at this point in our story, we're going to leave that alone. Remember, this is about worship. Judah has just experienced a, an awful tragedy. A king that's been on the throne for decades. They knew this guy. And despite his faults, they loved him. And he died horribly. Leprosy. Leprosy is a kind of disease to where you cannot feel your skin, you cannot feel your extremities, and you end up having it decay and rot and fall off. You can't feel the stove when it's hot. You can't feel bumping into something. And he died that way. 
And so you have Isaiah who is broken. The Bible says that in the year that King Uzziah died, it's fresh in his mind. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Stop right there. How did he see the Lord sitting on a throne? He came into the temple. How did he get into the temple? You need to know this, and we kind of hit on this last week, but you need to know this, that we as a church need to allow people to see the Lord. We cannot keep them out of the four walls. We must demolish the four walls and go out and tell people and bring them in. Because as far as I can see in the Bible, the Lord is always calling out to people saying, come, come to me. I love you. I, have, I want to have mercy on you. Come to me. I want to offer forgiveness. I want to take care of you in your time of need. I am God. You are the people that I've created. Come to me. I don't want to shut you up. I don't take pleasure in the death of people. I want to bring you in. And we as a church have to have that same heart, that same desire. And so God sees this man, Isaiah, in his time of pain, in his time of brokenness, in his time of need, and says, come on in. Come on in. I'm getting ready to blow your mind, but come on in. And I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. And something that I picked up from, uh, he's, he's now passed on to be with the Lord, but uh, a theologian named R.C. Sproul, something I picked up for him that I hadn't seen before, but he says this, when you see Lord with the capital L-O-R-D, and then later on in, in the scripture, it says Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's spelled the same way, but it has different connotations. In verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. So it's capital L and the little O-R-D. That word right there, Lord, means Adonai. Everybody say Adonai. Adonai. Adonai is the title. It is a title. Title of God who is sovereign who is the ruler. It is his title. He is the sovereign one. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, it is kurios. It's pronounced kurios, meaning Jesus is Lord. When it goes to the New Testament, it talks about that Jesus is Lord. He is the sovereign. He is the one that doles out mercy and justice and grace and all those different things, but he is the one in charge. And then later on in, the, in these verses, when you see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord, it means Yahweh. Can everybody say Yahweh? Y'all say Yahweh. 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 Don't cough and choke on yourself means that is a name. The other one was Adonai, which is a title. This, the capital one, is the name of God. It is the name of God, the, the existing one, the self-existing one. And so we see Adonai, Kyrios, the Lord Jesus Christ, And then later we see God as totally existing, self-existing. He needs nothing. He has himself. But in this term right here, in this verse, in the year that King Uzziah, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. And I believe that this is what's called a Christophany. Christophany could be Explained like this, it is a vision or a, a sight of God, the Lord Jesus, coming into the Old Testament. And we've seen this before. You remember those teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And that wicked king, man, he throws them in that, in that furnace. And it's so hot that the soldiers get all burned up just being around it. But they come on in. 
Oh, you're going to worship God? Okay, we're going to throw you in that furnace. And they get thrown in the furnace. And there was another one that shone. Mm -hmm. A man that shone up. An angel of the Lord. Quite often when you see that phrase, angel of the Lord, in the Old Testament, you're talking about Jesus. Based on what I see here in the word Adonai, I would not be surprised, and I can't say this as solid, but I would not be surprised if we're seeing Jesus on the throne. Offering, and he is going to be offering so much to Isaiah here. But in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And I think about the word temple, and in the New Testament, the Bible talks about that our bodies are a temple of who? The Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. The train of his robe filled the temple. And I wonder how much of us and how often are we filled with the presence of God? How often are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Verse 2 says, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings and with them he, two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And here you have this weird creature. And a seraph literally means an angel that is a fiery angel. Somebody that is lit. Very powerful. And with two, he had, with two wings, he, he covered his eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no clue about the holiness of God. But these angels were spe specifically built so that they could handle the holiness of God. And they're right there in the throne room. This is their job. They're right there in the throne room and they see the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe fills the temple. And these seraphs, they have six wings and they cover their face. Why do they cover their face? Because even them, even these angels who are, they don't have sin, even in their perfection that the Lord created them that way without sin, even them, they can't even handle the holiness of God. And so they can't even look upon it. So they must, they have to, they have to cover their face. And with two they flew. Why did they fly? I'm not really sure, but I know this, that with two, they covered their feet. Even the very ground was too holy to walk upon, I think. Their feet had to be covered up, and their wings on their backs to keep them flying, keep them off the ground. Somebody experienced that holy ground walking, and it was Moses. Remember Moses was told by God, Moses, take off your sandals because on this ground that you're walking is holy. Take off your sandals. And he allowed him to do so. How much does God love us to be able to allow one of his creation like a human to be able to walk on holy ground? And he's not allowing this angel to do so, but we are blessed and highly favored. And with two, he covered his face. With two, he flew. And with two, he covered his feet. This is holy ground. This is not to be tread upon. Your job, angel, is to glorify God. Verse 3 says, and one cried to another. That, that crying is, is not crying like weeping. It is literally a loud proclamation. I've got to let you know. I have to let you know. And he said, and they said this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole thing with holy, what is holy? What is holy? Holy is this. It is separated from other things. We are sinful creatures. We sin, but God is holy. He is set apart. He is apart from everything else. And God 
who sits on his throne is apart from sinfulness. But he's just, he's not just holy. He's not just holy, holy, but he is three times holy. This whole thing with holy three times, saying it three times, is reminiscent of where God is and where he is spreading his glory. It's interesting to think about this, the holiness of God. And these angels say, holy, holy, holy. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul that he said, I once knew a man who got taken up to the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, he got taken up to the third heaven. And it reminds me of, of that on the first heaven where you have the, you know, the, the weather and everything like that here on earth, you've got that. And then the second heaven, the Bible describes that there's space and planets and comets and all that. But the Bible talks about the third heaven where God is, where there is no sin. And I believe it's reminiscent of that holy, holy. I'm not just holy on earth. I'm holy in space. I'm holy in the third heaven where there is no sin. I am holy everywhere. And I am not only just holy, 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 holy meaning, or the holy, 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 say it three times, the number three in the Bible states completeness. And it's not that I'm just holy, that I'm just staying away from sin, or I'm battling that sin in my life, and I've overcome that sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not just that. And it's not just holy, holy, where I'm an angel, and I was created by God, and I don't know any sin. It's not just that. It's that I am God, holy, 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 and I have no sin whatsoever, and I am completely set apart. And I am other, he says. I am God. I am completely holy. And I think that sometimes, especially in America, Christians, listen up. If you're doing anything right now, all eyes right here, please, I beg you. I think in the Western culture right now, we do not understand this holiness because if we did, we would be flat on our faces at some point in our life. And we, we anticipate sin and we make a special corner for it and we rebel and we keep it as our pet. And we, here's the worst part about it. We choose not to do anything about it. And we can look away and we can run away from it, but God has our number. He has our number because he loves us. Not because he wants to bring the hammer down. He loves us. And he's created us to be like Jesus. It's the whole purpose of the Christian life, to become more and more and more like Christ. It is not me, but Christ who lives within me. And there needs, honestly, in our lives, there needs to be an everyday self-examination to weep over your sin, to grieve over your sin, and to beg and ask God, help me, and he will, but to help me to overcome. We do not understand holiness. I don't understand holiness the way that I need to. But here's what I'd like to do with this church. I'd like to make a pact with you that from here on out, especially in our worship, that we start to seek out God and his holiness. And we not, we're, we're not going to start to or continue to keep sin as a pet. It's not fair to the world out there that doesn't know Jesus. It's not fair to God and it's not fair to ourselves. Right. We lose all the way around. Understand, I, I, you know, I don't want to browbeat or anything like that. I'm just, my heart is this. I hate my sin. You know, I was asked in my interview when I, when I first got interviewed to come up here, I said, what's the worst part about ministry and, and what, what's the really bad thing that, that you notice? 
And I said, my sin. And it's true. I hate my sin. I don't want to be like that. Here's what I want to be like. I want to be like God. And so part of this admitting that to you is for you to help keep me accountable. But God is holy, holy, holy. He is not only holy in heaven, but his holiness is spread out all over the earth. In verse 4, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And whenever there's holiness, you are literally shaken. You are shaken to your core. When you're going through your personal, private, quiet time with God every day, and I hope that you're having that, because if you're not having that, you're skipping out not being with your best friend. And when God approaches you with that, the core of our being should be shaken. Just like the doorpost. Imagine it. Isaiah's there, and it's shaking. And he said, and then verse 5 says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We're going to put a pause on it right there, and I'm going to do a recap, and then we're going to walk through this with Isaiah. The recap is this. Again, King Uzziah has died. The nation is without a king. People are hurting. Isaiah is hurting. There's great depression within his heart. And he comes into that door. And when he comes in, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And the angels do their thing by saying he is holy, holy, holy. And the train of his robe fills the temple. Are we getting the picture here? This place is filled with smoke. You have a man who is broken already, and he comes in to the temple. And he comes right up to God. And he says, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. He is already broken. He is depressed. But as a prophet, a prophet knows that part of what he proclaims is judgment. And whenever you see a prophet in the, in the Old Testament, he, 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 he pronounces blessing, but he does pronounce judgment too. And that word for woe is me, that, that phrase is literally a judgment upon himself. I've done the, ex, the self-examination. I've seen the Lord high and lifted up. And I am right now, God, before you even judge me, I am judging myself before in the midst of a holy God. My worship starts right there. You've done enough, God, already. I get it. I see who I am. I am undone. And that word undone literally means this. I am literally disintegrating in the presence of a holy God. I am broken inside. I see my sin ever before me. King David said, I am undone, I am silenced, I am destroyed. And then I am a man of unclean lips, I have a dirty mouth. And I dwell in the midst of a, of a perverse generation that does nothing but curse and curse God, Isaiah says. And why are you pronouncing this judgment upon yourself, Isaiah? He says this, for my eyes have seen the Lord. And my question to all of us is this, is daily, are we seeing the Lord? Are we able to, with Isaiah, pronounce self-examination on ourselves and say, I come to the realization, I am not God, he is God, I am not, therefore I need God. Help me, God, because I know that you love me. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, and here it comes. We've heard bad news up until now, but here comes the good news. Here comes the seraphim. And I wonder what those wings sounded like. 
Can you imagine? Can you not wait to go to heaven? I cannot wait. You know, we, we confess Christ as Lord. We realize that he lived a perfect life. That he died for us on the cross. He was taken down off the cross. He was buried. And three days later, he rose again. And he spent some time on the planet some more. And then he rose up and he went to heaven. And if we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins and turn away from those sins, we will get to be with God. And we'll get to hear the angels' wings flap. I'm looking forward to that. I'm a man of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the, the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm undone. But the good news comes. He sees this angel flying up. He flew to me. He flew to me, Isaiah says. Again, God has not forgotten you. If you're one, it's, he, and I've said this before, I'll say it, I'll keep on saying it. It's like he's taking you, his hands, and putting your, your face in his hands and looking at you dead on in the eyes. I've not forgotten you. Yes, I see the sin that's there. But I, I love you. I have the mercy. I have the grace to pour out towards you. Here I am. I'm for you. I'm not against you. And if you've come to me for forgiveness, then your sins are in the past. They are as far as the east is from the west. They are gone. And I love you. But he flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. So he flies, get the picture, he flies over to this place where the live coals are. And if we could have that picture of the live coals, please. And he takes them and he puts it in his hand. And then verse seven says, and he touched my mouth with it. God is so gracious and I, Dear one, I know it hurts when God is correcting us in the midst of our sin. I know it hurts. And no, we shouldn't be doing it in the first place, but God loves us enough to correct us. He loves us enough, and he will use people to do it. And he will use circumstances to do it. And the wise people say, yes, I'm ready for correction. We don't like it, but God comes over and he says, I provided a way. And he touched my mouth with this hot live coal. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Stop right there. When I was probably eight or nine years old, and if we could get those, the, the, the coals to show up again, when I was eight or nine years old, I used to struggle with canker sores. I don't know if you know what those are. They're basically blisters within your mouth. And I used to suffer from those. And they got so bad one day that we had to go to the pharmacist. And the pharmacist uh, gave us, no, he didn't give us, he sold it to him. Can you believe how sadistic this man is to sell instruments of torture to us? <laughs> anyway, there are these long cotton swab things that had a chemical on it. And when you put the chemical on to the blisters, it cauterizes them. It burns them. Silver nitrate. Okay, silver nitrate. There we go. And it put her, and I'm telling you, there was literally, not kidding, there was smoke coming out of my mouth. <laughs> because it was cauterizing the wounds that were there. So I could get healed. Just the other day, I, I forget where I was, but I was eating a hot dog. Somebody had hot dogs, and it was the kind that were filled with the cheese, and I bit down on it, and the cheese went on my lips. I'm telling you, I had a blister right there on my lip because of it sizzle. But Isaiah confessed that he is a man with a dirty mouth who dwells in the midst of a people who are a perverse generation with unclean lips. And he says, I am here. And that angel comes over and he takes that 
That coal, which is, by the way, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Every time that you see fire in that context with healing, it means that God is here. So behold, this has touched your lips. Here we go. Let's pick it back up. Your iniquity, your continual pattern of sin that you refuse to give up. Your pet sins. That's what iniquity means. Your generational sins. Sins that your father had, your grandfather had, your grandmother had, that have followed you and you picked it up with them. You learn what you see. Mom and dad. Grandparents. Kitties learn what they see. Your iniquity, that continual pattern of sin, I am breaking it in the name of Jesus. Right now, I draw a line in the sand and I say, no more. This is it. Your iniquity is now taken away. And your sin is purged. I have cauterized the wound that has hurt you so bad. I hate to see it. And I want, I want you to have freedom. And instead of using the coal for judgment like he did in Ezekiel 10.2, he uses it for healing. Ladies and gentlemen, the instrument for your healing is not, only, or is not always God saying, I'm coming down on your heart. No, it's not. It may hurt for a little while, but there is, there's freedom to come from it. And I would say this, that God's glory... His holiness must touch us so that we may be changed. And dear one, if you have not experienced the holiness of God yet, which means love and mercy and grace come along with that, come right alongside with that. If you've not experienced that yet, self-examination time. There are a ton of folks and stats back it up all over North America that say, I am a Christian. A majority of people in this nation say, I am a Christian. Then why is our nation suffering so? We're either being so silent or that's really not the case. After his life has changed, after he has gotten the healing from Christ, verse 8 says, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Of course he says this. He says, Here am I. Send me. And you'll notice that us. Who's he talking about there? Us, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right there. And dear one, he only sends those who worship him. Those who do not, he puts on the shelf. He sends those who worship him. And those who, who have experienced God's holiness will truly worship. Have I cornered the market on worship yet? No, I haven't. It's another reason why we're going through this series, so that I can learn. There is a, there's a, a deep sense in my heart which says, I have a long way to go before I touch the heart of God. I need, I want so much to be the worshiper that he calls me to be. And I am not there yet, and I want to be. But he sees that heart from us. He understands the, the, the desire. And he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then God replies back, okay, I'll take you at your word. Go and tell this people. And then he gives all of his instructions. Isaiah comes into the temple, sees God, is broken, is hurt. But he perks up because he hears the flapping of the angel's wings. And he sees the angel come to him. And he's, oh my goodness, here it comes. It's going to hurt. And pfft, I've confessed my sin, but here it comes, the healing that I so desperately needed. And God says, I see you. I see where you're at. Who will go for us? 
And then Isaiah is clearly able to say, I'm set free in the name of Jesus. I'm here. Send me. And I'm going to go now. This is the story of God buying us back. And the whole point, most of the point is that we can glorify God. We can worship God. So here's the homework. If there's any homework whatsoever, here's the homework. If we are not experiencing the holiness of God, let's stop playing games. The, the homework this week would be get on your face before, I don't know how else to say it, get on your face before God. Join me in doing that. I'm saying, God, am I missing it somewhere? If I'm not, okay. But if I am missing it, show me. I want to be right there with you because that's what he wants with us. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come to you in our hearts, we, we ask that you would truly help us, help us to worship, but help us to understand your holiness. And if there's anybody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, take the pride out of the way. Take the sin that's, that should be ever before their eyes and show it to them. But show them that the cross even brighter so that they can escape. Give them, give us salvation that we need. Father, if there's any among us that do not know you as Lord and Savior, bring them.